Dublin slums were some of the worst in Europe. They were bleeding grounds for tuberculosis and other diseases. Indeed, recruiters from the British Army in World War I declared that the slums of Dublin were far more unhealthy than the trenches of Flanders. It is an interesting argument about the way slums came to prominence. It is all too aware that a large proportion of young Irish recruits were born and reared in the slums of Ireland and Dublin. Very interesting.
in preparation for Narnia Rebellion, the basement of Liberty Hall, the trade union headquarters, uh, turned into a munitions factory, where dozens of women and girls manufactured bombs and cartridges. And one of those girls was the aunt of the problem. We were all geared up and trained and preparing for a rebellion. I didn't know where the rebellion would be, but it would mean a change. And after that, we might have our freedom, and the world would be a different place. So many hopes infected in this uprising. The hopes of underpaid workers, the hopes of women deprived of political rights, the hopes of Republicans whose deliberate freedom so many wanted. Now, women are not informed of the detailed plans for an uprising, but when Gordon finds out that the riot will take place on Easter Monday, 1916, it was Boone who delivered the messages to volunteers across the country. The danger for arrest was high, and women could travel more freely than men uh, and, and not be suspected. Jane Connolly's daughter, Nora, was one of the many women who set out on bicycles, alerting volunteers in all parts of the country that the rising was to go ahead. But the events of the Easter Rising Club will be familiar to most of you here tonight, and it's not my intention to detail a well known story, although anyone who has questions on this happy to talk more about afterwards. Um, in the time remaining, what I want to do is to highlight the various roles undertaken by women during the Easter week in Northern Italy and the long term consequences of their participation in this fight for political freedom. On the morning of Easter Monday, April 1916, 24th April, a large number of volunteers, and members of the Irish Legion Army, men and women, set out from their trade union headquarters in Liberty Hall and marched to various posts of key buildings in the center of Dublin. It was on the steps of the General Post Office where today, I think people have this is uh, in the, the artillery fire and still kind of a hole in the artillery fire, the hole in the it's a very dramatic place to, to visit. And And here on the steps of the GCO, the rebel headquarters of the Cabbage Group, read out the proclamation of the Irish Republic. To a largely unimpressed civilian population, it must be said. Now, interestingly, this proclamation um, did specifically, uh, uh, it, it, it's interesting that in the proclamation, it made specific reference to the equality of men and women. It tried to get it addressed to Irish men and Irish women, right, at, at the outset. And there's several references throughout the rebel, uh, uh, policy about equality to all of its citizens. Um, so you can clearly see the hand of Jane Connolly uh, in, in the composition of, of this declaration. Now, at first, members of Cumber Mon were turned away from many posts, including the GCO, but renewed their speech for leaders in order for the group to accept any women who wished to take Dr. Kathleen Lynn, who was a captain in the Irish Christian Army, joined the garrison at City Hall and attended to the first casualties going home. Dr. Lynn had received her medical degree in 1899 and spent her life working to improve the health of Irish and poor children. So you see the sort of convergence. People who are interested in questions of poverty, of children's health, finding themselves um, trained in weapons and involved in a revolution. She was a supporter of the labor movement, and she took part in humanitarian aid during the 1913 Dublin lockout. And she was appointed the chief medical officer of the Irish Christian Army. At St. Stephen's Green, Countess Marcus took up her post as second in command. Sixteen women set about removing civilian and garbage debris, commandeering vehicles, 
Governors were furious at the death and destruction caused by the rising, and they were much of this anger was directed at the governor himself. Um, over 108 buildings had been burned to damage the property and sought and sat wasted alone in Mount O'Connell Street for close to two million pounds. Government figures for casualties among civilians and prisons came to over 300 killed and 2,000 injured. The anger of the people was heightened by the fact that the rising had taken place while there was a war on, a war in which many Irishmen were fighting and the British army. There were 85,000 Irishmen. And this created tensions and resentment not only between the men, who liked to fight war, um, but also resentment among the women. And Cooney, a young member of the Hunting Mob, remembers being haunted by Dublin's so called separation women as she admired the performance in jail. So these separation women were the wives of Irish soldiers serving as the British armed forces who would have been receiving allowances. Other than the corruption of government offices caused by the rising, these allowances were sought. So their families were in a desperate state, and it wasn't always that court judges and not the judges and the brothers uh, surrendered. Uh, so they were facing severe uh, hunger and hardship until the city and its government offices began to function normally again. So amidst this rubble and uh, the looting that was done. Because there was a shortage of doctors, <laughs> um, 
but and eventually she was admitted back into the country. Now women who had taken no active part in the rising found themselves arrested and imprisoned in Nassau jail or for in their homes, ransacked by British forces simply on the basis of their family connections to non nationalists. In the months following the Easter Rising, women's organizations maintained communications and support to the Republican women, a group, the Republican movement. Women immediately set about destroying and incriminating papers and delivered messages to the families of those who were interned. Now, this is a typical, one of the typical jail cells which would have been much as it had been in March. Now, we must remember this is a time when there were few social services in place, and families of those who had been killed or imprisoned were destitute. Kathleen Clark, the widow of Tom Clark, one of the executed leaders, had been left 3,000 pounds and instructions from the Irish Republican Brotherhood to distribute the aid to the families of volunteers. And this was a woman who was suffering a triple bereavement. Her son had been executed. Uh, sorry, her husband had been executed, her brother had been executed, and she herself suffered a miscarriage just, uh, just uh, weeks after the rising. And, and here she is gathering all of her energy, organizing um, and engaged in, in, in fundraising, trying to, to reorganize the political effort. The National Aid and Volunteer Dependence Fund set up a system for collecting and distributing funds to families in need. It was the administration largely undertaken by Cummins and on. It was estimated that with 78 volunteers killed in the rising and over 2,000 interns, the number of dependents in need, if you look at all their um, uh, children and, and wives, you were looking at 10,000 people who were in need of some kind of assistance. Women and men active in nationalist organizations had lost their jobs following rising, and they too were in need of employment and assistance. And a very interesting note regarding the role of this fund and the future war of independence led by Michael Collins. When Michael Collins was released from internment, he became secretary of this fund. When you think about it, it's a very shrewd move because here's Kathleen Clark, who's been left with all the contact information for all of the active Republicans and their families, contact list addresses for all over the country. Collins becomes secretary of this fund, and he has access to all of these records and this very effective network of supporters, which he then does actually effectively tap into when fighting the war of independence uh, in, in 19. The widows of the executed men, uh, there he is, in his volunteer uniform, where often you see things figured out in his Irish Free State General's uniform, you see his volunteer uniform. He was actually given a bit of a ribbing for turning up in Ireland in 1916. The widows of the executed men became a potent symbol of the 1916 leader's sacrifice, and they helped to shift public opinion behind the Republicans of the efforts in the rising. Uh, there was a number of commemorative postcards and magazines and other materials that helped to raise funds for the Republican cause and they featured often the images of not just the executed leaders but their families as well. And they also brought the human face to the tragedy of each of these. And especially poignant was the story of the marriage of Joseph Plunkett and Grace Gifford in the chapel of Plunkett jail just hours before Joseph was executed. They were in state agencies or something in the age. This story, he was sentenced to, to death and she was admitted into the chapel um, just hours before his execution. Um, they were allowed to marry um, the only witnesses were the, the British soldiers and they could they could exchange no words except the actual marriage vows. Um, and so they were married and then um, hours later he was so, um, as sad as the events and images were, it's interesting to know that in the aftermath of the rising, uh, the popular images of women were those that emphasized their roles as patriot mothers and widows, women who willingly sacrificed their sons and husbands to the struggle for political freedom. 
images of women in military uniform as equals in the Republican struggle were already being quietly erased from public memory. So what did women gain? As the first anniversary of the rising approached in 1917, women were determined that the promise of equal opportunity and equal citizenship uh, contained in the proclamation would be honored. A number of the women's organizations that I've mentioned tonight, the Union of Erin, Comte the Irish Women Workers Union, came together to form the League of Women Delegates. This is a picture of uh, Catherine Margaret's campaign uh, for Sinn Féin. Um, and uh, they lobbied, so see all these different women's groups lobbied to have women represented on the executive of Sinn Féin, the Republican Party that was emerging as the dominant force in Irish politics. Countess Markovitz, uh, Kathleen Clark, Dr. Kathleen Lynn, and Grace Plunkett were all voted on the Sinn Féin executive, and Hannah Sheedy stepped in and later became director of the communications. The 1918 general election was the first in the United Kingdom where women over 30 were allowed to vote. Countess Markovitz ran as a Sinn Féin candidate and was elected, thus becoming the first female to be elected as a member of the British Parliament. She's often not recognized as such because she didn't actually take up the seat. Because, of course, the policy was of Sinn Féin was one of abstention. They didn't recognize the British Parliament as a legitimate body. So they said, you know, we will defeat the British by ignoring them, was basically their solution. So Sinn Féin um, members did not take up their seats in the British Parliament. And instead, they established their own parliament in Dublin with Doyle and Aaron. Margaret, uh, as a member of the Doyle, was appointed Secretary of Labor, becoming the first female cabinet minister in Western Europe. Women were active in the War of Independence, but followed on the heels of the Easter Rising, and once again, the women were crucial to providing a network of support to Republicans in their guerrilla war with the British, providing safe houses, engaging in espionage and communications, and hiding and smuggling weapons. In the Irish Free State, which was established in 1921, women were granted the vote on the same basis as men. So all men and women over 21 had the vote. And this was a right that English women had to wait for until 1928. So they got six years before uh, the English. Now the Irish Free State, although it granted Ireland an independent legislature, at least for the South, was not the republic that so many fought and died for in 1916. So Ireland was once again thrown into a civil war, a bitter, a bitter struggle with pitted fellow Irish men and women against each other, often against former comrades. Now, interestingly, in this war, when hardline Republicans are fighting Irish authorities this time instead of the British, far more women were imprisoned by Irish authorities than they were uh, in the 1916 rising. Why is this? Because the Irish forces know how useful women have been in earlier Irish uprisings. So they aren't going to dismiss them as silly little gals and send them home because they know how valuable they are and they know that they ought to be locked up if they're going to crack down on this, uh, on this civil war. So they didn't make the mistake of underestimating women's political and military commitment, but it came at a higher cost to women. I began this talk by suggesting that we need to keep in mind different definitions of freedom and the overlapping nature of the struggles for justice and equality in these turbulent periods. The establishment of an independent Irish government and the granting of the vote to women did not mean that victory had been won on all fronts. Premier Eamon de Valera's dream of a mythic and self-sustaining Gaelish countryside bore little relationship to the realities of Irish life in the 1930s, the 1940s, and the 1950s. This was a period characterized by high levels of poverty, tuberculosis rates were still the highest in Europe, um, unemployment, and soaring emigrants. In the 1930s, when Dr. Kathleen Lynn attempted to provide health care services for the poor women and children of Dublin and implement the vaccination program against tuberculosis in her children's hospital, she made severe opposition from the Archbishop of Dublin, who was suspicious of any undermining of the church's influence health care and social services. The 1937 constitution introduced by Anna de Valera enshrined a particular ideal for Irish women, 
identifying their proper place in a home as full-time wives and mothers. And this was reinforced with various laws passed in the 1920s and 30s, which barred women from certain civil service positions, restricted their service on juries, and limited the employment of women in industry, and established a lower pay scale for women. And interestingly, if you look, there are women deputies um, in uh, the Doyle in this period, and there is a vigorous debate about this. This is not just simply accepted as being the values of the time. There is a great debate about this, and there's often reference made to the 1915 proclamation saying, this is not what women were promised. Um, and, and you're sort of not living up to the ideals of 1916 with this, this legislation. And it did just narrowly pass with some of this. So there was debate. The full, free, and happy life for all envisioned by James Connolly had not been achieved for men or women. Certainly for those in the labor movement, for those in women's organizations, the reality of independence paled in comparison to their dreams in 1916. The Easter Rising led a torch for revolution, and it lit up a vision for a future Ireland which guaranteed the equal rights of all of its citizens and cherished all of its children. It promised happiness and prosperity for all. Women arrived at this pivotal moment in Irish history through different avenues, concerns about health and welfare of poor families, struggles to earn a decent wage, and a determination to win an equal voice in politics. In the immediate aftermath of the rising, with so many men in prison were executed, it was left to women to prevent this torch from fizzling out. That all their goals were not achieved does not take away from their astonishing and so far, as some of these struggles still continue today. We hear their voices still. Thank you very much. I would be happy to take questions, and I'd also be happy to hear other uh, people's own knowledge and information and detail on the things that. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, 
um, that we're seeing uh, trying to achieve their political goals, uh, you know, using illegitimate methods. Um, you can describe them as terrorists, right? You know, I mean, you're doing. But the war is changing. I mean, even when they were involved in our And so Ireland 
so James Connolly and other trade union leaders said, we can't put up with this. We need a kind of workers' militia that will protect us from the police. That's the original purpose of the Irish Citizens Army. It's not to fight for the public. It's to protect its workers from police brutality. And I'm not saying all the workers were all in this. Um, situations are always much more complex than that. But, um, you know, Connolly's sort of fighting two fights. He's, he's fighting against poverty and, and poor working conditions, but he also sees that Ireland needs a republic. But for him, the two go hand in hand. And in fact, when they're arming themselves for the 1916 rising, he sort of whispers to his comrade, hold on to your rifles, you might need to use them against the republic. Like maybe all the Republicans aren't going to be timid for um, the working man either. Um, and in fact, has anyone read uh, Roddy Doyle's novel, A Star Called Henry? It's a wonderful novel and has um, the part that's set in 1916 has Henry kind of firing at the window of the GCO at the shops, the fancy goods across the way, a shop that he could never afford to shop in. And because he's got two targets, and it's a target for the British, but his targets are also sort of the wealthy employers and the people with money in town. And he's saying, you know, at the end of all this, is it going to be any better for the working man? You know, I'm sure. So there's a, it's not so much that people are immediately arming themselves to fight poverty. It, it partly comes under this lockout. And then once this group is formed, and there are plans for a rising, that this is an organized group, they're, they're trained in weapons, they're trained in first aid, and they decide to commit themselves as well to this political fight, apart from the economic fight that they've been involved in. Very long <laughs> explanation. Does that make sense? Well, and labor has pretty effort to see this. Well, it's an interesting question that I pose for my students in my Irish history class. Is the question is, you know, does violence work? Because we, we can look through it, Irish history, and we can see how the violence leads to more violence. It leads to splits in different groups and disagreements over what their goals are, and then those groups that were once united now fight with each other. But I think you honestly have to look at it and see that sometimes the violence actually has worked, and so it's. It's not a comfortable political fact, but uh, there's been times where you think, well, you know, would they have got home rule if they hadn't had that long of history? Perhaps they would have, but it's not an easy. I think we have to be very careful not to romanticize violence, because that was certainly what was done, say, in the you know, 50th anniversary of, of the 1916 rising, was to sort of romanticize it. I mean, completely buy into sort of Pierce's poetic vision of you know what we need is a blood sacrifice, you know, and people will rise up. James Connolly said, that's just rubbish. You know, we're all going out to be slaughtered, and I don't want to hear any of your poetic justification for it. You know? um, so I think we have to be careful to to not just dress this up in some sort of rosy patriotic um, but, you know, so, so the, the violence was, um, but they were also at the same time, I think we have to recognize the political commitment behind it, um, but not to kind of romanticize it. Well, her health was very badly impaired from the prison. In fact, quite markedly in photographs, if you look at her, you know, for a short period of time, is how her health deteriorates. I'm not sure exactly what the date of her death. I mean, she does go on to serve um, in the government, but I think she, she ends up dying quite poor. Um, and I don't have a date of her death. This, it, this is why I don't quote so much now. It runs out of time. I should have brought it back to my book this up. But the, a lot of the women who were involved in 1916 after the War of Independence, when there's a treaty with the British, and they get the Irish Free State, but it's not the Republic, and it's not a united Ireland, a lot of women who were involved in politics vote against this treaty. And, and 
they become actually quite a hardline Republican and uh, in favor of uh, going to war to fight for the Republic and achieving that group of hardcore Republicans.
you're in, 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 you're in,